it's time to work on this J10 again. Now, you may have seen my previous video where I pieced this thing together, swapped in the 300 cubic inch Ford six cylinder with a five speed manual. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it might be worth looking because I'm going to build off that now. Now, when I last left off, I tried driving it and uh, it did. I moved it across the yard. There's no brakes, uh, a few other minor issues like that, so I didn't go very far, but it would start and drive. The starter made some horrible grinding sounds, uh, but um, you know it worked until the next day. The very next day after I did that video, uh, the starter stopped making the motor turn over, but it did continue to make the horrible grinding sounds. So I figured I'd rather do something about that. Now step one is getting to start again. I also got to get that Dodge Dakota radiator I put in here. I got to get to fit under the hood. Uh, last time it was up too high and I couldn't actually install the hood. I also want to get brakes on it. So those are my goals. Let's see how far we get. Found the problem with the starter. The problem is the starter. Specifically the gear. Now, uh, this is something I did on my own, and uh, this is a learn from my mistakes moment. This starter is indexed off this hole that goes into the dust shield over the bell housing. I don't know if you remember in that last video, that dust shield has the wrong size. It was for a different starter, so I just bored it out bigger. I made it too big. So what happened was, the starter didn't have the surface to index anymore. Now I knew it was going to be oversized. I figured the bolts would hold it in place. They didn't. Here's a close up of the hole. Here's the bolt that goes in it. Both these bolts choo, slid all the way to the side of their hole and um, the starter basically you didn't have enough engagement between the teeth of the starter and the flywheel teeth. And it wore off the tops of the teeth of these and no longer turned the motor over. So that mistake cost me $13 including shipping. I had to buy a new starter drive gear. Now I have to put this gear in that starter and uh, then everything should be back to where I was. And then I'm going to put some bushings in these holes to make sure it can't move and uh, hopefully that will keep it in alignment. We'll find out. Was easy to fix. Now it's time to make up the spacers that are going to hold this on center. These holes are about 460 in diameter, so about a hundred thou bigger than the uh, bolt that goes through them. I've got some aluminum coupler nuts, which happen to be the right thread for the bolt that goes through them. So what I'm going to do is turn down that diameter to fit these holes tight, slice it off, thread it onto the bolt, and I'll have effectively a shoulder bolt right there. So uh, I'm thinking this will work. Let's find out. Here's my bolt. It's got the sleeve on it. Put a washer on there. And um, it's a tight fit. It's actually going to end up being, as I tighten down the bolt, it's going to press itself in because uh, it doesn't slip through. But I figure that'll give me the tightest possible fit here. So uh, let's install it and see how it works. Okay, I've got my not quite dead battery hooked up. Wiring is um, alligator clipped together, so let's see what happens. There we go. Starter's fixed. That sounds better than it ever has, at least since I've owned it. Let's hook up the ignition, see if it fires up again. Okay, still runs, which means I better get that radiator back in here. Got my radiator. Uh, this one I'm pretty sure is out of Dodge Dakota, but um, it came close to fitting. What didn't fit was these tabs right here. There's one on either side, and they were too wide. So what I'm going to try to do is bend them 
and then use them as a mounting bracket so it'll get them out of the way and make it easier to bolt on. Let's see how easy you can bend a radiator. All I did was notch that raised section, so now this should bend easy. Oh yeah. That might fit. We'll go for, try it out. Those bent over tabs fit perfect. I even found some pre-existing holes to run some self-tapping screws in. So right now I haven't modified the Jeep at all, it just is the radiator that's been modified. Uh, so uh, right now it's good enough for yard use. Some strange foam came out of the radiator cap when it started warming up. Um, hopefully that's just rust. I don't know. I uh, might have to be changing this coolant at some point. Um, or it could be indication of some major problem with this motor, because I've never actually driven this motor before. I just bought it from some guy who said it ran good. So uh, anyway, but it does. It did start right back up and uh, it drove over here. The throttle bearing is making a new squeaking noise that wasn't there before. And that's an internal slave cylinder uh, yeah, the internal slave cylinder style throttle bearing, so that won't be fun to change. But I'm going to ignore that too. For now, I'm going to look at wiring. I have this pile. Something in this pile will do what I want. Now this appears to be a coil connector, um, and the green one is probably negative. The other one is probably positive, so I think that's my coil feed. And then I have wires that went to the solenoid, and um, yeah, one of these has got to start it. So I'm going to try to figure out which ones work. Now this wiring is really old, as you can see. You can see that it's very, very brittle. Um, pretty much everything just collapses. Because remember, this thing spent a couple decades sitting in the sun apart. And out here, the sun destroys stuff. And that long, uh, pretty much all that wiring is going to be shot. Luckily, these Jeeps are known for their quality wiring. I mean, these Jeeps are known for the wiring shorting out and catching on fire. So uh, we're just going to try to use the factory harness. This one, the one that looks like it's in the worst shape, uh, looks like it's thick enough and has the right terminals. This is probably my main power feed. Uh, and this looks like a connector to the alternator. And that appears to be uh, electrical taped in. So we'll just undo this here. That actually looks like it's done really well. That's soldered. I'm not going to be using this kind of alternator anyway since I have a Ford on here. You know what, I think what I'm just going to do is snip the wire here and add a new connector and that gets rid of this whole mess and this one too. So uh, yeah, that'll, that'll be fine. Got the wiring where I think it needs to be. Let's see what happens. We got a fastened seatbelt light sign. That's a good sign. It's running for the turn of a key. And it shuts off. That's always a bonus. I figure it's time to actually bolt the seat down. Last time I drove it, I just threw the seat in. It didn't have anything attaching it. But it didn't really matter because I couldn't stop and it wasn't going to slide around. So uh, now I might actually use the pedal. In which case, I probably want to have something to push against. One thing I started to do was uh, that foamy dirt, rust stuff coming out of the radiator. I figured I'd flush it. So I went ahead and flushed it. it took about six or seven times running water through it before it came out clean. And then it came out the water pump also. So I don't know if it had this leak the whole time or I just started noticing it, but it's time to change the water pump. So I uh, did notice one good thing about this Ford motor. They made so many of them, parts are pretty cheap and plentiful. Picked up a water pump and uh, it was a Rock Auto wholesaler discount closeout deal, but 10 bucks. So uh, that's not too bad. And now I'll have a new water pump. Now, this Ford motor is actually really easy to work on. Um, four bolts without a water pump, easy to get to. I'm glad I stuffed this radiator as far forward as I could, because I've actually got a lot of room here to work on. Got the pump bolted in, hoses on, but I don't trust it not leaking yet, so I'm going to fill it up before I do the belts or anything, make sure this actually holds. And if I need to uh, fix any leaks, it's easier right now. Now, one trick I always do when I'm opening a new coolant I always get the uh, concentrate stuff, so you have to mix it yourself because it's much cheaper that way. But you got to make sure you know what's what. Once you mix it, it's hard to tell by the color. So what I do, I make a slit in it on a fresh bottle. That way I know I have not added water to this bottle. Then when I go to mix it or do something else with it, I open that all the way up 
So now if I take the cap off, I've got a slit in it, it's pure antifreeze. If it's all open, it's mixed or something else. Now another thing I want to take care of is uh, this battery tray. Now this is one of the Dodge uh, spare front end I used when I built the shop truck. It's sturdy. It's got a nice block holding it up. Problem is, it's so thick, it's tall, looks like the battery's going to hit the hood. Uh, and I don't want to destroy the paint that way. So, I'm going to pull this out. Get rid of my block of wood. And now I'm going to make a battery box that um, bolts here and does something here and holds a battery somewhere here. So, we'll make up something. While I've got this all open, this alternator, uh, this is an externally regulated model. So that is not going to be compatible with the wiring from the truck. So somehow that's got to make some voltage to go to the battery in order to keep this thing going. Now here in my pile of junk, I've got a spare Motocraft alternator, which I got for free and tried to use on something, but this is uh, no good. However, it's the same style. In order to get this to work, I bought this, which is a piggyback uh, regulator, which basically sticks on here. It's got a little wiring diagram on how to do it. And basically you hook up the wires to the field and the terminals and the ground and all that good stuff. And this should act as a voltage regulator. Got that uh, regulator attached on. Got a couple of uh, washers, the spacers to hold it out. Then all the wires hooked up. And a nice thick wire going to the positive terminal and the solenoid here. So that'll connect directly to the battery. So in theory, next time I start this up, it might charge. Now I'm always trying to save money whenever I can. So uh, I'm certainly going to avoid buying a battery box for this thing. Uh, even at the junkyard, they're probably rusted out anyway, even if I could get one cheap. Uh, so I'm going to make something, but I always want to take the easy route out. And I like to reuse old stuff. Now, what I have here is an old section of that coot, that amphibious vehicle I redid a little while back. So let's see how that fits. I have one mount here. Right about here, there's a hole in the, this uh, radiator support where I can attach a bolt. Got some bolts here, or holes I can put bolts in. And uh, I might even be able to brace to this. So I'm gonna take this old section here, which covers up, Now I hit that hole, and I hit that hole. If I fold this up, I can probably weld a brace to that hole. And uh, I can use these holes of the battery tie down to clamp the whole thing in. And uh, that might do. So let's go ahead and make it. That piece seems to work fine for a battery tray. Got it bolted down the bottom there. I got it bolted to that one on the radiator support. It actually seems pretty sturdy. So I'm going to get the battery in position and then add a bungee cord to make sure it's a real professional install. I'm doing a little bit of parts hunting. This is always a good day. Now you may have noticed I've got a lot of junk on this table. Some of it even relates to this project. One of the things is the wrong Hydra Boost. Um, this is the wrong one because this is the only one I could get. Now I was going for a Chevy Astro Van Hydra Boost and uh, the one you want is the early 90s because where they mount to the firewall is a flat plate. This one is a later model with the angle plate. Also this one uh, was already removed and uh, everything was left open. All the parts were open, the master cylinder cover was off it. Uh, I'm not even sure if this thing's going to work. But it was the only one I could find within like a hundred miles and uh, the price was right. So, you know, I'm going to go ahead and use it. Now I can get replacement units if I need to, but that's like a hundred bucks or more. And a uh, hundred dollars plus for brakes seems really excessive. But if I have to, I guess brakes are kind of important, especially on the road. But uh, we're going to see if we can get this one working first. Obviously this angle plate is going to be an issue. It looks like there is one big nut at the end here. I can just undo that nut, pop it off, plate comes off. Now a little bit of research I did, uh, it looks like people have used the older style one with a flat plate and a spacer to mount to these Jeeps. So when I'm debating, I might be able to cut the plate, cut the inside out, cut the outside out, weld it to a piece of tubing, and make my own spacer and plate at the same time. But no matter what, this nut has to come off. 
And I just realized if I do that and put it inside a piece of tubing, that nut will probably not go back on. So scratch that idea, we're doing something else. Now well, let's take this off and see what we got. Yeah, it's a little tight. If you're doing this, there's a snap ring here. Don't forget to take that off, otherwise the nut won't come off. I just learned that. These channel lock uh, pliers here, best ones I've used for snap rings. Uh, they've got a switch on them. So you go, that one expands them, flip the switch, and it retracts them. Easiest setup, setup I've ever seen. So, I like those. All right, I think I have a plan here. I've got the original spacer that was mounted to the um, power booster, mounted to the firewall. I've got the pedal rod actually hooked to the pedal so I can get a distance of how far I need to move it. Uh, it's a pretty good amount. Looks like I have to space it out around two inches or so. So um, I'm gonna need to move it out pretty good. I'll get an exact measurement here. I'll make it all straight, but it's gonna be around two inches. Now, I have this plate that doesn't work already, but the inside part works. Strangely enough, this square pattern is the same as the one used in that booster adapter, so that would bolt right on. Problem is, that is not two inches thick and it's not straight. However, found a handy piece of square tubing, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slap this down here, go in, make some marks on a square, so I can take out the inner part and weld it right to the inside of the square, then, after I cut that out with the square here, mark my straight lines I need to cut to make that fit over this, cut this to the appropriate length, weld that to this, the inside part to the end, and I hit up my spacer and everything in one shot. Now, I already had mentioned the fact that I'll never be able to get to the nut once I do this. I found a way around that. That nut is a four-point nut. This square tubing almost fits exactly over it. So what I'm gonna do is make my own socket wrench, stick this in, twist this in order to tighten down that nut. And I think I'll be able to put it all together. Let's find out. Got it roughed up. Uh, what I have is the inner part of that original adapter plate that was an angle is welded to this piece of square tubing. That's the outer part. And I've got a hole cut into it so the tubing fits inside. Right now, that's not welded. It's just pressed up against the adapter with this little bungee cord here. Basically, I want to see if everything fits that way, uh, where that rod is in relation to the pedal, and um, make sure everything works before I weld that last one up. Okay, we have the rod here, pedal here, that looks pretty good. I'll make a bushing that fits here real tight, and um, I think we're in position to uh, weld this together. This is what I ended up with. There's the inner part from the original bent brace. Here is the outer part. And I end up being ooh, around 1.65 thick. And I think that'll work. It looked good when I mocked it up, so hopefully once I welded it, it'll still look good. Uh, and I welded this on both sides because this is going to be under all the braking stress. So um, it's going to be pretty sturdy. Now, oh, hmm, might throw a coat of paint on it. Kind of looks like it deserves it because it looks really bad as is. So uh, maybe we'll paint it, then install it. Got my bracket all painted up. And uh, let's see how this all goes together. They've been marked which way is top. There we go. Oh. One thing I did before I uh, painted this, I, there's a folded up lip here. I trimmed it off on this side. That's a strengthening rib. We don't need it now that we have the box welded to it. But um, right there, it's about where the clutch master cylinder reservoir is. And I would have been cutting my thumb open every time opening that reservoir. So I planned ahead a little bit and gave myself some clearance and nice radiuses. So hopefully this won't injure me. Next, We've got to turn this into a socket for this. Now it doesn't quite fit. I'll use an adjustable to bend it a little bit to give it a little bit of a flare. And that fits pretty much in. I'm gonna do this. I 
There. Now the nut is inside the tube. There's a hole in this piece of tubing. We'll attach a handle of some sort. And there we go. That tightens pretty decent. I'm going to throw this thing in a vise to make sure I get good torque on it. Okay, I got some pretty good torque on this, so I think we're in good shape. But I'm going to pop the snap ring on. That'll be an extra safety feature. So at least it won't come off completely. Now that's in place. I'm also going to go ahead and install the adapter that was on the old vacuum booster in. And uh, then the whole unit will be ready to bolt onto the firewall. I've got to make this hole smaller because this is where the brake pedal actually actuates it. This is the bushing that would go on that brake pedal. And uh, obviously that's huge, uh, big gap there. Um, I found some tubing, which is just about the right size. So this bushing will fit inside that tubing. The tubing fits here, and it's got just a little bit of play, not too much. So what I'm going to do, slice off a little section. Now I'm noticing that these are chamfered. Uh, this hole is chamfered on both sides. So I'm going to cut off a section of tubing that's this width, and then flare it inside this uh, rod. So that should make this a permanent insert that I can then just drop this bushing into. So uh, slice it off and then we'll try and flare it. All right, got my bushing. Now I made it slightly wider than this rod. I'm gonna try and flare it. I figure the flaring's not gonna go smoothly, so I'm just gonna grind it flush afterwards. The sleeve is in there, there is no play at all, and uh, bushing fits in perfect. Well, uh, the Hydro Bruce is mounted, and I'm going to hook this up. According to internet wisdom, these lines should go straight to the Astro Master Cylinder. One fits, the other one's the wrong size. This is too big. And like I said, I had the wrong booster. Apparently this is the wrong master cylinder also. Uh, this is a later model one, they have different ports. So I've got this old master cylinder that's been exposed to the elements, there's mud in it, the ports are wrong. Um, I might just get the right one and buy it. All right, it's master cylinder time. This is my original one. And it had basically a large reservoir and a small reservoir going to the front and back. And then we have the two different ports. The small port went to the large reservoir. The large port was in the back, went to the small reservoir. This is the one I got that's the, uh, should be the right one. This one also has a large and a small, but they're reversed. So the large reservoir is in the back, the small one's in the front, but the ports are also reversed. The large one still corresponds to the small reservoir and the uh, small port goes to the large reservoir. So I'm gonna have to switch my lines around, but it was still we're matching fluid volume with the right size port. So uh, I think we'll be okay there without a problem. Now the other thing to look at when switching around master cylinders, this one right here is the one that came with my Hydro Boost. The distance from this mounting surface to where the plunger goes and pushes it uh, is critical. If that's too long or short, it won't really work with the booster. Uh, in this case, it looks like they're identical, so I should be fine. But it's something to look for. If that's really deep or shallow, you could, uh, you could have a problem with your braking. Um, if it's, uh, you might be able to add a spacer for one way, but if it's going the other way and it's pushing it in too far, you may have a problem, maybe you have to shorten the rod. It's not unsolvable, but you want to be aware of it because it can cause you a lot of headaches. But looks like I'm in good shape. I've got my early 90s master cylinder. So it should bolt onto my Hydro Boost, the line should hook up, and uh, this should be a bolt-in affair. So uh, let's slap it on there and see how it looks. Got the master cylinder in, those lines bolted right up to that new master cylinder, so that all works smooth. Um, everything looks clean. Had to bend the lines a little bit, switch them around, but everything worked out fine. Those little loops gave me plenty of room to work with. And I have plenty of room for the clutch, Everything here is clear. I'm ready for figuring out the hydraulic lines. 
Now I've got my line going from the Ford pump to a fitting that does not fit this Hydro Boost. So that's next. All right, in order to get this Hydro Boost hooked up, I am going from a Ford power steering pump to a Chevy Hydro Boost to a Jeep steering box and then back. So I'm gonna to need to figure out the hoses. So I picked up a power steering hose for a F-150 where the motor came out of. So that should have the correct fitting up here. Now this is the power steering hose meant for the Ford. It has a Ford specific end. It hits the fender well. So I'm gonna use this the wrong way to try to put a bend at the beginning and uh, try to tighten up that curve. So hopefully I won't ruin it too badly. All right, let's see what that does. Has the wrong fitting on this end. I picked up a hose for a Astrovan. One of these is a correct fitting to hook to that uh, Hydro Boost, but it won't hook to the pump. So somehow I'm going to have to splice those two together. The inside of this hose is about right for the outside of this one. So that tubing, I made a mark to line them up. You can slide it one inside the other. And now I just have to connect those two in a non-leaky fashion. So uh, let's use heat. Molten metal is always fun. Well, wouldn't you know it? I just ran out of gas for my TIG. So uh, can you MIG tubing? We're gonna find that out. Seriously? Now that's not working. Well, it's not pretty, but let's see how it works. I've just got the pump hooked directly to the Hydro Boost. I've got clear return lines out of that. I'm not pressurizing the power steering pump first. Go on to flush it. I expect a lot of fluid will go through back to the tank of return. A little bit might come out of that bleed line. I think every time you hit the brakes, when it uses the fluid and releases, that comes out this bleed line. I'm not sure about that. I have no idea how much fluid it's gonna be. Hopefully I don't overflow this too fast. Well, the pedal feels rock hard, which is not good, because I have not fled the brakes yet. I think at this point I probably flushed everything out of that map hydro boost that's gonna come out. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and hook up the power steering pump and see if we have power steering. Here I have one of the lines for the um, Astro Hydro Boost. Um, this one has the correct fitting for my power steering pump, the correct fitting for coming out of the um, the Hydro Boost, and it's too short. But I'm looking at this curly Q thing they got going there. I think I have enough length, it's just all bent up. So if I straighten this, it might work. It's definitely longer. I'm gonna do some test fitting and more bending, but that's the technique. This is how far I had to straighten this in order to get it to fit. Pretty much every bend had to be straightened out and even the end a little bit straighter. But I think we're good now. There's air in it, but it's trying. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and hook up all the return lines. Uh, it looks like I keep getting air in my system, so I don't know if I've got to run that out or uh, what's going on. But uh, I expected the brakes to do something. It feels like the Hydro Boost itself is seized up, possibly rusted from sitting outside. But it feels like the steering just has air in it. So uh, I'm gonna try to purge all of it and keep working with it. Worst case scenario, now I have my lines hooked up, I can replace the Hydro Boost, but um, those are expensive. So we're gonna try to fix it. 
I found enough old fittings lying around to make myself up a T. Uh, this is not the right way to do this. For a system like this, they make power steering pumps that have two returns, so one pressure out and two back in, and that hooks up everything properly. So basically, you don't want pressure from your return going back to the hydro boost from this bleed off. But it's gonna be pretty low pressure because all it is is going in the reservoir. Now, according to internet wisdom, this will work as long as you have the main line going through. So basically from the box, the return that's flowing most of the fluid is the straight shot to the reservoir. And then the bleed off, which doesn't have as much, comes in the T. Uh, so this should work out fine, I assume. Now, if you're planning on doing an install like this, there's a lot of resources for putting a hydro boost on. Um, they're very good, probably more informative than what I'm doing here. But uh, one thing I noticed is most of them assume you knew how the stuff went together in the first place. When you start with a hydro boost that was just loose and a power steering pump that, you know, the lines you had been taken off, which I did, but I forgot what I had done. And uh, I didn't know which one was pressure and which one was return. So if you run into that, let me show you. On the hydro boost, the side next to the accumulator is the pressure in. The other side, which has the uh, pressure out that goes to the power steering pump and the bleed off hose, those are together on the same side. So both things that go out are on the same side. On the power steering pump, the side next to the pitman arm is the pressure side. The other side that's a little bit closer to where the steering column goes in is the return side. So that's how you hook up those boxes. The pump is pretty self-explanatory. Basically, you have a return that goes right into the reservoir, it goes straight in there. And then the pressure is the port that comes out somewhere else. Um, so that's, that's pretty obvious when you see the line going into the reservoir. I got my return lines all hooked up and I'm ready to try this thing again. No brakes whatsoever. The steering's really jerky. Uh, I don't know. I need a win here in order to keep myself motivated. So let's check that charging system. There we go. We got voltage. So charging system's up and running. Well, I took the master cylinder, pulled it away from the hydro boost, and um, there's rust in there, which I ignored that last when I put this master cylinder on here, but it probably is the real problem. I bet that hydro boost is completely seized and not moving at all. So, um, I gotta do some exploratory surgery. Um, I was about to tear into that hydro boost and try to see what's wrong with it. I decided, while the master cylinder's off, I'm gonna try pressing the pedal and see what happens. It went right down. That hydro boost is not seized, it's moving. Now, thinking about it a little more, I bench bled that master cylinder, so I know that moves. The problem has to be in the lines. Now, I've run into this on this truck uh, a few times, and more that I've even shown you on camera. Um, there were mud wasps where this was stored. With all the lines open, almost every single line I've run into is clogged with mud wasps. I'm wondering if they got in the brake lines too. Makes sense, should have thought about it. But uh, they might have clogged the brake lines to the point where no fluid will move through them, so the pedal was rock hard because it wasn't doing anything. That might be my whole problem. Nothing to do with the hydro boost, nothing to do with the um, master cylinder. Maybe. We'll try this one. Apparently that works. I'm glad I didn't tear into that stuff. Now the vacuum is holding pretty steady. Which makes me think a clog is upstream. Got the top side of that line off. Try to run a piece of wire in there. Stops dead. I'm gonna try using a little drill bit to drill through whatever's clogging the line and see what it is. Because we should get a little residue on the end of this drill bit. Yep. That's dirt. Okay, granted it's got oil in it. But I bet more mud wasps clogging the lines. Now I'm trying to feed this wire in in order to run through that uh, line and clear it out. This is how far I've gotten so far. And uh, I still don't have a clear line. But lots of junk coming out. I was doing pretty good in my battle with the mud wasps inside the brake line. Spent about an hour trying to shove a piece of safety wire through. 
got about four inches in. So I made about three more inches of progress from where it was, and then it just would not go any further. Switched to MIG wire, thinking this is stiffer and meant to be pushed. Chucked it up in a drill, so I just would spin the wire as I was pushing it in, like I was cleaning a drain pipe. Um, that was working actually pretty well, until the wire broke off inside the line, flush, so I couldn't take it out. So, I cut the line. This is the problem. Let me see if we can get close enough to see it. That line is completely clogged. Um, yeah, so, it looks like when I cut it, I heard the vacuum suck, so I think the rest of the line is clear. I think I've got it all. So I'm gonna stretch out that curly Q loop um, to the point where there's not nearly enough of it left and shove this fitting on, reflare it, and I might have brakes. Maybe. I'm not making any promises at this point. Breaking out the suction gun, see what we get. Uh, I've got fluid in it. I bled the brakes, just the front ones. I haven't even bothered with the rear yet because I haven't cleared out that line. Looks like I got the air out of the system. I have not touched the pedal. Figure I'll let you guys be here for that. So I'm gonna attempt driving this, hit the pedal and see what happens. possibility I have too good of brakes, or at least um, too good of sticking on in the front. I I'm stuck on level ground because the front wheels don't turn anymore. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's it for today. <laughs> now, obviously more work needs to be done. Um, I gotta get the front brakes to release now. I'm betting they're just full of crud and they haven't moved forever. Uh, it might go away on its own. Uh, could be collapsed lines. I'm going to let it sit for a little bit. If it depressurizes and then rolls, um, then I'll know a little more about it. But in the meantime, I, I actually have another project coming in here. So I got to uh, put this off for now and get on to something else. So I'm going to cut the video off here. Um, we do have a lot of successes though. We've got the um, starter working, which is nice for starting. Uh, we've got the radiator cooling, which is, you know, good for running. Uh, the battery's charging. The uh, brakes are working uh, somewhat. Power steering kind of works sometimes. Um, at least it's better for driving in the yard. I'm less worried about hitting something and more worried about actually getting moving. So uh, I'm calling that a win. And uh, we're gonna work on this again. You will see it coming up for sure. I will get this going, but you're gonna see a few other things first because I got some interesting stuff coming up. But uh, till next time, you guys keep having fun and I will too. You may be wondering why I was running a spare tire in this video. Uh, it's because this is the last one I had that held air. This spare is pretty good. It has a little bit of, uh, you know, minor defects, but um, I figured since this truck looks like it might get on the road soon, I'd pop the money for a used tire. It has tread and no cracks. So in the next video, this is gonna be on there and we're gonna try to put this truck on the road. Found out rebuild kits for those calipers are only a buck 83 a piece. So, Brakes are going to be solved soon.